Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. You're with the Build Back Better Innovating Through Partnerships uh, webinar for the next hour or so. Thanks very much for joining. Really delighted to have a, a great set of speakers and, and a co-facilitator as well, um, Carol, who I'll introduce in, in a moment. Um, just to do a quick check, make sure you're in the right place. This is the third webinar in the series in conjunction with the Zayed Sustainability Prize. Um, today focus more on the health space and partnerships. So we're going to be looking at powerful innovations in the sector, impactful shifts. Um, our expert panelists are, are going to tell us about some exciting work that they've been doing in their organizations and with others. And we'll also try to look at uh, 2030, what success would look like with the SDGs and how we get there. I'm Denise Lane. So I'm one of your facilitators, a partner at Sustainability and ERM, um, and joined by Carol Smets. Carol, I don't know if you want to say a quick hello, if your sound is a uh, connection is up to it. Yeah. Hello. Hello, Denise. Thank you for, for, um, for introducing me. I'm Carol Smets. I'm uh, based in Paris, partner RM, and in charge of corporate sustainability and climate change for Southern Europe. Um, I'm very sorry, my, my bandwidth is not good today, so I will do my best to, um, to, to assist and support and facilitate this uh, discussion today. Fantastic. Thanks, Carol. That's, that sounded pretty good. Um, but want to not go much further before we introduce briefly uh, the speakers that we have with us today. So maybe if you could just each, if you can unmute yourself to say your name and, and, and where you're joining us uh, from in terms of organization and, and also maybe where you're sat today, which is mostly uh, homes for, for us, I think. Christina, we'll go uh, left sure. to right. Okay, yeah, I'm Christina Tibbs-Kadl. I'm the founder and managing director of um, Endeavor. And we are enabling inclusive uh, systems innovations. So we are curating and um, change processes with uh, large companies and other actors to get us to sustainable systems. And I'll be speaking about research um, with uh, Business Fights Poverty on how to innovate rapidly in partnerships. Right, so hi everybody, I'm Katie Hyson. As uh, Christina mentioned, um, I'm the Business Fights Poverty per person, um, but I've also been invited here, I think, because for the last 15 years, I've been sitting within big businesses trying to um, engage and unlock ideas um, and energy and business mechanisms to deliver social and environmental good and alongside uh, business sort of profitability. Uh, some will call this entrepreneurship, some will call it employee engagement, sustainability, whatever hat it sort of gets put under, um, that's me. And today I now work for Business Rights Poverty. I'm the director of their thought leadership. Um, we're a network of 26,000 people, professionals who care about business trying to be a force for good. And uh, yeah, as Christina said, we have been doing some work recently around collaboration, partnership and innovation. And we have some great examples around the kind of health conversation. Fantastic. Hi everyone, um, my name is Annika Schmeider. I'm an Associate Fellow at Chatham House, the Centre for Universal Health, um, which is how I was invited here today. Exciting and um, my real interest is in how we bring innovation into the global health space and the, the global health domain, if you like. So um, at the moment I work as the Global co uh, Program Coordinator at the Centre for Genomic Pathogen Research at Oxford Big Data Institute. Um, but prior to this, and I'm in London, um, prior to this I worked at the WHO and I've worked with the World Bank on data governance and so on. And so it's really, to me, about how we bring some of these new innovations into uh, global health generally and, and specifically as a global public good. Fantastic, thank you. All right, sorry guys. Hi, I'm Anne. I'm located in uh, just let's say Copenhagen, Denmark. We have opened up our offices 100%, but due to logistics, I'm still working from home uh, once or twice uh, weekly. Uh, I will be bringing the corporate perspective to the conversation today in terms of both what have we done here and now due to COVID-19 and, and also what do we see of potential I, it's a big word, but what do we see a potential shift or at least things that we see we need to address? I definitely uh, uh, think, and we can also see evidence that the COVID-19 has even uh, put the lens uh, more narrowly to some of the challenges that at least we see uh, for the patients uh, that we are serving. So I look forward to this uh, next hour and uh, look forward to all the uh, engaging questions as well from uh, the participants. 
Excellent, fantastic. Uh, we'll be looking forward to it as well. So just want to give us a, a bit of framing for, for the discussion. Um, I mentioned earlier that we're doing this in conjunction in, in support of the Thai Sustainability Prize, which is the UAE's pioneering global award in sustainability in, in the areas of health, food, energy, and water. And there's also a, a program supporting schools. And its sole purpose is really to recognize and reward the achievements of those driving high impact innovative and inspiring sustainability solutions. Um, and that is open currently. Um, so they've extended the application deadline and looking to get those entrepreneurs, intrapreneurs, uh, those pioneers in, in innovation in these areas um, recognized and, and supported to help scale and, and grow those, those innovations. So if that's you, um, if there's innovators and entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs on the line, please do take a closer look if you're not familiar with it. Um, just go to the, the next slide, please. Uh, it just gives you a little bit more uh, color, I think, to that and the desired sustainability prize has really taken the 2030 agenda and the sustainable development goals um, as, as its framing and really seeking that clear and sustainable um, delivery of, of human development and, and looking to um, drive forward more solutions. So definitely go to the website for more information. You'll see some of the great previous winners and some of the um, great uh, judges and evaluators of the prize. We were um, joined yesterday by for one of the judges um, on the food aspects. So we had Helen Monday from the Food and Drink Federation. So she's, she's a, a good example of some of the judges um, making decisions on the prize as well. But with no further ado, wanted to just deepen our framing today in, in the Sustainable Development Goals as our context and, and really the imperative to meet the 2030 agenda. Um, I think a number of uh, us on the line will be familiar with, with this agenda, but just to recap, the goals were, were set by the UN in, in 2015. So we're at the, the mark where we have the next decade um, to go to really achieve uh, the world that we want in terms of sustainable development. And you'll see in the image here, the 17 um, high level goals that, that have been set. Um, set by the UN and, and every country is, is reporting on their progress year on year, but with a very clear call gov to governments and business and civil society and other actors to have take up their role in helping to achieve those. Um, so it's, it's really taking that next decade in focus and, and driving um, progress in, in all these key areas. To put a little bit of a health lens, I think you could look at that framework of 17 goals and find many, many different connections to, to human health. And it's important that we do that. But just to briefly shine a light, I think on, on, on the most direct connection here is obviously to SCB3 on good health and well-being. So the, the key there is to, to be ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being for all at all ages. And to, to paint a little bit, I think, of a picture of the challenge, um, I'm sure our speakers will be very familiar and, and a number of you on the line. It is a, is a challenging um, in, environment where a, a number of people around the world are, are still uh, struggling to access health and health healthcare. Um, we still have um, quite de devastating, really, um, mortality rates of a particular population. So you see here a stark uh, statistic of children under five in some parts of Africa and Asia. Maternal mortality is still high, and that is a focus of, of some of the targets under SDG3 um, in, in terms of infectious disease, um, and such as AIDS and HIV-related deaths is still very high, um, and, and interlinked with other uh, indications like, like tuberculosis. So it's a, it's a complicated space. There's still some big strides to be made um, in, in health. So we wanted to also just reflect um, ourselves and, and some of the work that we've been doing and what we've been seeing in, in the broader health landscape. And, and this actually comes from um, a trends uh, analysis we did in 2019. And so actually Carol and I were on a webinar around this time last year discussing these three kind of um, macro trends in the health space. And so not new developments by any means and, and certainly permanent possibly in some of their concern, but one of these three is, is uneven access. So we've mentioned that, that um, already, but I think there's different uh, precise statistics, but you'll find them broadly in the thrust that potentially um, over half of the world of, of the world's population isn't um, getting the access they need to, to essential health care. Um, and that can be also be attributed to pushing people into poverty as a result for paying for those health care costs. And so the, the thrust of the SDGs as well around the growth of universal health care and promoting that in different markets and, and nations around the world um, is critical. And I'm sure Annika and others will, will touch on that. Another part of the picture is, and we think potentially part of the solution, is taking more of a One Health perspective and, and framing to all of the work that we do. So that's really not seeing um, human health as, as delinked, but actually inextricably linked with the health of planet um, and also animal health as well. Part of that is the preservation of biodiversity. So we know that, you know, for instance, ecosystems, if you take into account all the potential 
benefits um, that they provide to our, our, our human health and, and put a value on it. It could be something like $33 trillion a year. Um, and that's a, a significant um, uh, value and significant in terms of, of human uh, health and, and life. So we think there's definitely more to come and we hope more to come um, with this One Health perspective. And that was a trend we were really um, seeing coming to the fore um, in, in recent times. The last one, and I, I think a bit, bit saddened to actually say that in 2019, um, over a year ago, even we were commenting from the broad sustainability perspective on, on the fragility of our health um, systems and our global communities preparedness to pandemics. So I think we, we were um, posing the question a year ago as are we working on becoming prepared? Are we merely vigilant? Are we kind of watching and waiting um, and not particularly proactively um, for that next pandemic and what will happen when it when it does? So this this is really, you know, written well before the current COVID-19 um, situation that we're in, uh, but, but very, very apt. It really putting all organizations uh, to the test. But I don't want to spend too much time uh, lamenting or, 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 or outlining the problem, but to, to suggest a few of the areas that were flag then and certainly continue to develop as potentially innovative solutions in the health space, just to kind of give a, a little bit of food for thought here. Big broad areas here, but point of care diagnostics um, is an area that, that's come up in a number of different arenas as, as particularly um, interesting and promising. We look forward to see what can be developed there. It would have huge applications in the world of um, antimicrobial products, for instance, um, and, and how we could potentially help uh, lo lower the, the spread of antimicrobial resistance, for instance. So that's at one spectrum. The other, thinking of social media and the very unique um, ways that um, could potentially be leveraged for the, for the benefit of human health, no doubt also very relevant in terms of some of the, the track and trace. Who knows, uh, there's, there's a lot of directions that this could go in. And finally, just a couple more, more thoughts here. Um, by convenient care, we're just thinking about all of the different uh, challenges in providing healthcare, and particularly at what cost and where. So whether that's mobile um, or, or other kind of forms of, of care centers that are outside some of the traditional um, spaces that we think about. And finally, um, again, just a big bucket of, of innovations here around telehealth um, that's been going on for some time, often in, in areas where people otherwise wouldn't have access. And then I think many of us are also experiencing it in, in our, our worlds, whether it's in London or elsewhere, where you, for a time we haven't been able to access our, our healthcare professionals in a face-to-face in a -face setting. So a lot of that has moved um, online into settings, much like we're engaged with today. So really interested to see where that might take us. So with that, a little bit of food for thought, I wanna turn it over to our speakers to, to share their, um, their work and their experiences. So we're gonna take a few minutes um, for, to hear from each of them and then bring that together in a discussion. And please do share in the Q&A box questions that you have for, for all of them, for particular speakers, or any comments that you have on what we've shared so far. Um, so with that, I believe I'm turning over first to Katie, um, a business based poverty. Katie. Hi all. Um, well, as I say, thank you very much for having uh, me today. There's a chat function for everybody who's um, attending. There's a chat function because I've got a couple of questions in here and I really, really like to hear from you guys in terms of what your thoughts are. So um, as I mentioned, it's all about partnering for us for innovation. Um, it's not just about innovating as an individual. Um, perhaps if we could go to the first slide. The key here is in the last 10 to 15 years, I've really seen a kind of massive decentralization of who owns the innovation. It's not necessarily just the innovation team anymore. Um, the people who want to get involved with innovation are um, far more focused on the societal impacts as well. Um, and therefore the crowding of um, ideas and different perspectives, um, et cetera, are really, really positive. And, and my presentation is a little bit positive considering uh, Denise has just set up a kind of like, you know, this is a, you know, horrendous. So three things um, that are really striking me that I'm going to sort of share in the next five minutes and um, one mega question. So three things. One is the COVID effect. So as um, Denise just said, we already are in a space where health is an un uneven access is just being exacerbated, but everybody is leaning in. So one is COVID effect. Two, everyone can innovate and at many different levels on different topics, not just here's a product, I'm going to innovate the product. It's often the system. It could be the process, et cetera. And the final piece is around scaling rapid innovation through collaboration. And Christina's going to pick up a little bit more on that one in particular. My killer question, and I would really love your thoughts on this. 
how do we learn from some of the rapid scaled innovation partnerships that we're seeing at the moment uh, because of COVID? How can we learn for this to rebuild better, to create resilience for the future? Um, because I'm nervous that we're going to do it once really well. Potentially, there are great examples here and we're never going to be able to repeat. And fundamentally, we could be staring down the barrel of much bigger societal shocks. Um, so COVID, uh, this slide just quickly shows um, we've at Business Facts Poverty partnered with um, UK AID or DFID um, and also Harvard um, Kennedy School to set up a response centre. So it's all about helping businesses just sit through their decision making um, around COVID. And what we've also seen is that so many businesses have got completely and utterly focused on this in terms of uh, all of their products, services, um, personnel, etc. So global health emergency, global fo focus on health. And for, for you know, the first time in decades, we're hearing from scientists and experts, which is wonderful in my, my perspective. A um, couple of other things I'm hearing again and again from the people that we're working with is um, there is a concern around some organisations using this global pandemic for self um, benefit and promotion and potentially some greed and corruption sort of creeping in there so there's a kind of request and call out and um, hand holding that you know do the right thing now or you'll be judged later and the other one the final piece on this one is really the kind of interconnectedness of health so if we can move on to the next slide so this slide um, doesn't necessarily um, represent what I'm going to talk about but I think it's a really important one which is around how do you collaborate for innovation and um, as I say Christine is going to talk a little bit more about this in, in a bit but I wanted to play on an example recently that I um, we do some work with a an alcohol company and for us this is uh, or for me this is a perfect example of innovation partnering but also where innovation for health can come from potentially all sorts of different examples so this drinks company, like many others, Global, has totally, radically, very rapidly transitioned to um, producing alcohol-based hand sanitizers. Um, but we're also seeing hotels being hospitals, Gucci making face masks, you know, everybody is innovating for humanity at the moment. Um, if we really want to solve problems, it's about breaking down these silos and creating the mechaniz mechanisms for rapid innovation. And for me, that those ideas, that opportunity can come from anywhere. And I think that's a piece I'm sort of trying to stress a little bit that we don't necessarily just need to look at the traditional health companies or um, academia to provide these solutions. So this alcohol company, I think is a particularly interesting one because of the, the speed with which they did it and the scale. So they've done transition to um, alcohol hand sanitizers at a global um, level within a few weeks and the way that they did it three things decentralized approach using technology to share best practice and replicate with pride so that again that sort of decentralization and that comes into this collaboration piece and it's what i'm most excited about so what you can see here are the th five opportunities but also five risks for collaboration because that's only through collaboration do i genuinely think that we can scale these innovations properly one value we have to communicate that value and why we're doing this really well but sometimes we get overload in that meaning goes hand in hand in glove with that kind of overload and fatigue connection so we need to connect why we're doing this how we're doing this with the consumer with the person the end person authenticity we need to do it properly um, as I say, we will be judged at the moment afterwards. And then finally, con convening, so bringing together the right people. If we can just flick onto that, the last slide, and I will then uh, pass over. So my final slide really today is around purposeful collaboration. So what we've learned over the last 15 years at Business Fights Poverty, where we focus on purposeful collaboration for all sorts of things, including innovation, is you need a clear how. So how are we going to do this? clear why so why are we doing this together um clear when clear what clear who and the, th the sort of three things to take away from this are that we definitely definitely do need a clear question that you're trying to answer 
know who the experts are and bring in those experts it doesn't matter how you share them and a, and a really clear laser sort of focus on the timeline so that you actually do get out and deliver um, as i say we do see some amazing examples um, that are going on now but my question back to you guys again is how do we make sure that we learn from the examples that you'll hear for the rest of this um, panel so that we can replicate this and do this again and rebuild better and make sure there's resilience in the system. So I think I'm going to hand over Denise via you, I'm sure, back to Christina. Absolutely, that's perfect. Uh, great segue, I think, directly to this rapid innovation. And I think we want to come back to that question um, very much sharing that around how do we make sure all this, this great innovation has an application or, or, or furthers a, a broader evolution towards building back better and it doesn't just solve a, a, an immediate uh, challenge. So Christina, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, and um, I'm going to echo a lot of what Katie said and uh, also, you, uh, Katie, your, your fear that we might just go back to normal resonates uh, a lot with me. Um, I think what, we, what we've been seeing in, in the crisis, as, as um, horrific as it has been, was also kind of a, a hope that we can manage the other crises that we have uh, ahead of us through collaborative innovation. And this is, um, um, yeah, I, I'll just present a few insights from the paper we have done. Um, and we must really see how we can harness these learnings and continue on that path. And not now that uh, things are going back to normal, go back to the old normal. There has been so much talk about the new normal, but I'm not uh, seeing it yet. So hopefully we can, we can learn from this uh, collabor collaborative spirit and from taking on big challenges and take it forward. Um, yeah, so um, if you go to the next slide, um, just quick, quickly again on what we do at Endeavor. Uh, we, we work as curators of systems change um, processes. So our work is to bring the right people together into co-creation processes to design the future we all want that serves people and planet. And that's why Mm, this research on these rapid collaborations has been very inspiring for me because it shows that we can take a different approach to partnerships. Partnerships are often viewed as risky and painful and that's why many companies avoid or uh, take a long time to go into them. Um, but what we've seen in these rapid innovations is that it's not how it has to be. We can take a much more agile approach to collaborating and, and fully leverage the the complementary capabilities of different partners. So on the next slide, I just have three examples from the health space that we looked at for this research that all came about within just a few weeks. So the research was done around a month ago. <laughs> Actually, it was very rapid and collaborative as well with, within just three days. So it's, it's definitely not a final, uh, it doesn't have all the answers and, and I would be keen to get your feedback and uh, this is supposed to be a living document. But within yeah, March, basically, we saw so many companies stepping up and not just um, contributing their own uh, resources to addressing the challenge, but also tying in with other companies um, or universities um, or public sector institutions to, to innovate and come up with the solutions that we needed at the time. Um, so one example here is um, GSK and Sanofi, two of the leaders in the vaccines development space and competitors actually joining forces to uh, work together around the COVID vaccine. And one partner brings, so Sanofi brings an, the antigen, GSK brings the adjuvant together. They have a really good chance of, of getting to um, a vaccine uh, quite soon. And uh, I mean, many of you are watching will know the pharmaceutical sector and what it means to build an MOU in the pharmaceutical sector. Um, but they, so the legal department is actually ruling, <laughs> if you wish, the, the company because everything has to go through legal. And, and these two large companies managed to get into this partnership within uh, just a matter of a few weeks, uh, which is amazing. Um, and, uh, and really pushing uh, very fast decisions in this collaboration by, um, by having installed a high level task force that is leading the collaboration. So really inspiring how these two giants can, can move it together. Another example that we looked at was um, Ford um, joining up with 3M to develop a new respirator model. And the innovation there was that it's mainly um, built with parts that both partners already have uh, in order to um, 
uh, avoid any supply chain issues. So that would enable them to produce uh, up to 100,000 units of respirators per week. Um, and uh, what uh, Ford said to this collaboration was that it's the largest combined effort by American manufacturers out of wartime to do in weeks what would normally take medical device makers to a month or even years to produce. So again, you can see the speed at which uh, together these two companies have been able to produce something new. Um, and the last example from a different domain um, I wanted to mention is uh, Vodafone, uh, who has been feeding governments with their data to, to yeah, see how are people moving and, and how is the social distancing working, tying up with a university, University of Southampton, to create a model that could also help uh, predict um, the further spread of the disease in different scenarios. So again, really nicely um, complementary capabilities um, together to, um, yeah, to address this challenge. And all of this, again, has happened within a few weeks. So what we were interested in this paper is how was this possible? So if you go to the next slide, um, just highlighting a few things that we saw. Uh, definitely the risk tolerance in these partnerships was much, much higher than it is usually in partnerships. And not every little risk factor was checked in detail before agreeing to work together because there was just no time and the urgency was there to move fast. Um, then also high level leadership to take decisions very fast was one of the success factors. And what everyone has mentioned is a laser focus. So I also like this uh, quote um, by uh, the Ventilator Challenge Consortium. Uh, we realized that there's a lot of noise and waste in our normal uh, daily lives. And if you cut all that noise and waste, you can basically move so much faster than what, what we're used to and do within, again, weeks what we usually do in, in years. So I think that's good inspiration to take with us into the post-COVID world. How can we maintain, uh, yeah, how can we keep cutting that noise out of our uh, work lives and really focus on what's es essential? Then extraordinary effort. So people have been working around the clock. Sometimes it's something we probably won't be able to replicate and don't want to replicate. Um, but um, I think we can translate it into a kind of an agile approach where we can design sprints around partnership to really progress fast. Often the issue that delays partnership is that you have these partners that each have to align in their own organization and among themselves. So there's a lot of process taking time um, and by learning from agile approaches and, and um, working more with sprints and, and dedicated time, maybe we can um, also do it a lot faster in normal times and the focus on the common good. So cutting negotiations about who benefits exactly in the end, that also really helped um, to get um, to an agreement much faster and to, to collaborate. Um, yeah, so overall what I'm taking from this is that an agile approach to partnering is possible. Uh, we haven't seen it a lot yet, but I think we can learn from, from these experiences to, to find a different approach that where you just start because you know that together you can uh, innovate and, and, and you have something there and you figure out things more as you go. You don't try to control everything up front because anyway, it's not possible to control everything up front also in normal times. And next. Yeah, just uh, maybe briefly to mention the, the models we saw, and there's more on this in the paper. So um, as in other collaborations, you have different choices for structuring the, these innovation partnerships. Sometimes we saw that an in individual organization was in the lead and the partners were uh, supporting, um, like Microsoft supporting uh, the uh, bio, bio research with their um, computing capabilities. They didn't really drive it, but they were supporting with their assets. Uh, then what we normally think of as partnerships, uh, collaborative alliances where both partners bring um, together, yeah, a complementary assets and it's based on some sort of MOU. And then thirdly, the innovation platform, something that we also saw quite a lot happening with hackathons and, um, and challenges to um, um, yeah, source uh, um, innovation from outside into the companies. And these can be done by one company or multiple companies in collaboration. So it's also a really nice way to speed up 
um, the, uh, the innovation by challenging others to, to innovate with you. I think that's um, all I've got. Maybe the last word and uh, also a mega, mega question. I like that, Katie, from you is how do we do this also uh, on a systems level? Um, uh, so um, I, we had an interesting discussion on whether these rapid innovations could also um, make systemic changes. And I have to agree that for now, the ones we've seen are more technical innovations um, that just solve a technical problem. But I want to believe that we can, in also these rapid innovations, take a systems angle. And uh, I believe that for that, we need um, more facilitation. So this is a, a quick uh, uh, picture on how, how we facilitate that with a methodology that we call IR2030. But I won't go into that now, just to flag that. Uh, I think um, rapid doesn't imply that it can't be systemic. And actually, we must. Um, look also at the, at the system's implications um, and how to strengthen our systems uh, going forward. Because if we just respond immediately, um, uh, and it was mentioned in the beginning, we might just face the same problem again uh, next year. So we really have to, as we employ so many resources now, think uh, how, can we, uh, how can we take it more to the systems level and strengthen the systems um, long term. And that, I believe, needs good facilitation and good method and I'll stop here. Interesting. Thanks, Christine. It makes me think of um, one of our uh, speakers yesterday and talking about food, uh, used the quote, I, for, I never remember it precisely, but effectively the problems are very complex, but the solutions are actually very simple. So maybe something to that. Um, excellent. We're going to move on to let Annika and Anne come in as well um, on, on a little bit more about what they've been working on. So Annika, take us through some of the, the work you've been doing. Great. Thanks. And such good, um, good thoughts from those previous uh, presentations. Um, so I introduced myself as being the Global Program Coordinator at the Centre for Genomic Pathogen Research. And for this topic, what I really wanted to do was just get across um, some of the concepts that we've already raised, but also to the platform of relationships and partnerships that have paved the way in order that this has happened in the way that it has. So I think most people will know that genomics um, and data science have been really fundamental to the COVID response so far. Um, what we work in is both the data science and the genomics. Don't ask me about the genomics, that's not my area. Data science, yes. Um, and bringing together the, the tools that data science offers in order to improve surveillance and analytics, so the first part of the arrow there, um, in order that you can look at a real-time pathogen analysis, national and global reporting, which has big, obviously been uh, quite an issue for this outbreak, and I'll show you some of our work in that regard. And of course, then underpinning diagnoses and treatment, drug and vaccine development. Um, the first genome, I think, was released in mid-January, um, and that's really triggered this kind of global response, which I think is really uh, quite profound and as we're talking about how are things going to be different for the future I think we have to look at how these triggers have helped us to form new relationships and different partnerships and different ways of working and and I think Christina really captured that before well yes the legal departments well they've had to discuss things quite differently and at, at pace so um, this is some of the the work that we're doing if we can move to the next slide this is a really nice encapsulation of um, some agile work for um, the centre which has uh, gone into partnership with I think around 20 partners in the UK. Could we have the next slide? Sorry, there it is. So this is mapping the COVID virus um, using the genomics that have been captured across the world and in particular the UK has contributed around 20,000 genomes to this data set. So I'm not going to go into the specifics of it all. It looks very colourful. We've all seen maps of varying descriptions. What I think is important with this is that it was, it's actually become um, a real global exercise in partnership to be able to combine all of these data together in a rapid way using tools and platforms. This is a platform that our centre um, produces and, and is um, uh, publicly accessible so people can add things to it, um, which I'll show at the end of these slides, but just to show that this, this is an enormous scientific research effort. And what they've produced, I think, is something that's really um, 
you know, it's a very long-term data set. We're never going to be able to reproduce this type of data set again at such urgent pace, in my view, and I hope we never have to again, um, I'll add to that. So that's just an example of what's happened during COVID. Um, if we move to the next slide, this is a little bit more retrospective, but this is for the Ebola epidemic. Now I worked in the World Health Organization during the Ebola epidemic and worked on data challenges, um, literally where people couldn't you know, count daily deaths, which some countries have also experienced with COVID, right? And um, surprisingly so, no, I'm not surprised. Um, but this gives an example of how genomes have been collected almost retrospectively, some of them to be able to populate um, what happened during the Ebola outbreak. So um, just another example, and again, this is from our MicroReact um, database, which is publicly accessible, and you can get in there yourself and have a look at a lot of the projects that are put in there. So if we move to the last slide, I'll show where the data science and the genomics have really come together. So these are the four tools that are publicly accessible, then we consider them a global public good. Um, MicroReact is the platform that you just saw that, that, that showcases the collections. Um, Pathogen Watch is a little bit more techy for those people into the genomics of it. Um, Real-time analytics for genomic epidemiology. Um, and if you look at EpiCollect and um, Dataflow, the interesting properties of these two um, tools are that they, you know, we've developed them for the type of work that we're doing, but they're actually accessible for a whole range of purposes. So EpiCollect is a general data collection tool and you can collect anything that you like with EpiCollect. And if you look at on the website, um, some, uh, some people have used it for dolphin watching or for environmental um, projects. So these are uh, tools that have been developed in a specific way for what we do, but they're generally applicable. and I think the value in this is that um, these types of tools and the partners that they've been developed with meant have meant that we've been able to flex really quickly for the COVID response. So my point being that um, a lot of things in health develop very specifically. We're developing specific things in very highly verticalized areas, but in the in in the COVID response, our ability to be able to use generic tools. Um, methods that are adaptive and accessible in a range of countries. So these are not just things that the UK can use. These have been tested in Asia Pacific and Africa um, in various countries, setting them up in their surveillance systems. You know, this has, has enabled this effort to actually happen. So it's not really spruiking our tools, more the approach that's been used here. Um, so with that, I'll end and we can move on to our next phase. Fantastic. Thanks so much. I think more I want to pick up on different mentions of, you know, technology and data and some interesting things in the chat as well um, and on how some of that might be hindering and also enabling in other settings. I want to come back to that. But Anne, uh, share a bit more about what Nova Norsk has been doing. please. Yes, thank you very much, Denise, and thank you to the rest of the panelists. I think also given that I think we would, I, at least I would like some questions and, and, and some conversation happening, I, I think my overall key message here is that I can confirm what the previous speakers uh, uh, have said. Of course, um, this will come with the corporate Novo Nordisk uh, perspective to both, and I would actually say prior COVID-19, during COVID-19, and what will happen afterwards. Because what we have seen with the COVID-19 is definitely that the, you can say, magnifying glass has been put on some of the challenges and need for innovation that we could see in the healthcare system, but also in, you can say, the greater society or community around the healthcare system. So uh, once it, uh, thank you, Denise, for, 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 for making sure we are having this conversation. And I have no idea how we will secure the learnings, but, uh, but, but let's see what, uh, what will happen. So uh, Novo Nordisk is a uh, global leader in diabetes, and uh, we have become one of the most, world's most leading uh, healthcare companies. And our purpose is to drive change to defeat uh, diabetes and other serious chronic diseases. If you move to the next slide, you can see um, uh, the company uh, stats as we normally present ourselves. And then I'll move fast into the next slide, which is focused on linked to the SDGs, because what Denise mentioned was the link to 
some parts of what the SDG3 is focusing on, but what is also something we learned prior to COVID-19 and why non-communicable diseases like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and chronic respiratory diseases have been included is that today, NCDs are the leading cause of death and disability globally, uh, causing approximately 71% of global death. And therefore we need to focus on NCDs and not just communicable diseases. And the thing about NCDs is that it's not just how it's dealt with in the healthcare system, traditional way of looking at the healthcare system, but it's also around looking at the community and how all, you can say, the components are interacting if you want to prevent premature death from uh, NCDs as target 3.4 is speaking to. And just in terms of magnitude, we know that uh, approximately, I will say 10% of the global healthcare costs prior to COVID-19 are related to diabetes. And with a magnitude of 700 million people potentially developing diabetes uh, in the future, uh, we need to figure out how we are maintaining that component uh, of how we grow as, uh, as, as, a commu as communities around the world. So please go uh, to the next slide. So, so, so what we are uh, going, what we actually were already planning prior to COVID-19, but we just released yesterday, is how we will focus on dealing with not just the, the, the healthcare system and how we, in a commercial sense, link into the healthcare system and try to deal with those challenges, but also how we will work with defeating diabetes by accelerating uh, prevention by also securing access to affordable care to vulnerable patients in every country. And finally, also figure out how we can be part of improving lives and help society uh, rise to, to, to the challenges of uh, diabetes. And as I just referred to, the COVID-19 pandemic has definitely, at least from our point of view, shown how uh, specifically the vulnerability of societies and patients in society and uh, also the vulnerability in terms of unemployment, the economic effects, how all healthcare, how you can say the payment to healthcare system is organized has uh, really uh, challenged uh, uh, countries in different ways uh, throughout the world. Some of the things that we have done, and I think this will come back to what uh, Christina was also leading to the principles of how we have then worked during COVID-19 in, in kind of organizing partnerships and, and, and doing what we do best as a healthcare company. So we have supported people with uh, COVID-19 and I picked a few examples and of course you can go to our website and see them all. But in the US, uh, we have uh, said that we will um, deliver insulin uh, for uh, free insulin for 90 day supply uh, for people who have become unemployed due to the COVID-19. We, uh, we'll, we have also uh, uh, committed to contributing to relief efforts and emergency situation. So uh, with uh, the International Red Cross and, and through the WHO, we have offered uh, uh, free insulin uh, and uh, hemophilia and growth hormone products that can be distributed throughout the relief system as well. And then finally, we have engaged on the R&D side of it because we have been uh, supporting both COVID-19 and antibody testing, which was not something we did before, but we are re, you can say, reorganized our laboratories in Denmark and also offered our uh, research center in Oxford to the NHS uh, to, to, to be part of working uh, with, with, with the testing of the COVID-19. So for the longer term perspective, uh, we will need to figure out how we are going to play a role in this transition needed. And I think I will speak to the point because I most likely could speak to all of them, but to the point of uh, prevention, because prevention is traditionally something which is outside the healthcare system, is not always a thing or an artifact. I think many of the examples that Denise was showing, some of them slightly moving into uh, some, some services, but at least a, a traditional innovation in healthcare is very much on the gimmicks or, or the pens or the products and um, the devices, etc. But we also will, we will also be needing innovation in so many other things in order to support the healthcare system, the future healthcare system. So we are looking into prevention. What role can we play? 
who are we partnering with, uh, how can we actually maximize and, and scale the prevention of the diseases uh, that, that, that we are engaging with. So we are seeking out partners, uh, the EAT Foundation, looking at the nutritional perspective, then linking into not just the nutritional aspect of it, but also the climate aspect of it. Linking with the C40, uh, they have a climate agenda. It's the major cities around the world, but we're also working with them on how how is that then interconnected with health? So trying to figure out to be innovative within, you can say, interconnected solutions. I would have loved to have like a long list of things I could share and then we're doing this and this has some really good, this is an effective prevention uh, intervention, but we are not quite there yet. But as soon as we are, I, I will make sure that, the, that we share those, um, share those uh, examples that we will be developing in the years to come. And I look forward to uh, continuing the conversation. So thank you. Fantastic thing. Thank you so much, Anne. And, and i um, really pleased to see, as you say, hot off the press, the social responsibility strategy and then what's to come there. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, very, thank very you. timely. Uh, so many, so many questions. And I, I suppose what I was kind of noting were almost some of the big arenas or opportunities for innovation that I'm hearing. So I think to, to pick up on the most recent one you mentioned and prevention, you know, so much uh, to do there still, uh, so many different um, avenues you could go in. I think taking from Annika, you know, the data is, is needed and powerful in the setting of, of surveillance and, and some of that um, key work that you're doing, but also, you know, from, from Katie and Christina, you know, something perhaps higher level around the ways that which we collaborate and, and someone in our panel yesterday on food mentioned the real innovation needs to be in our mindset perhaps um, and some of the chat function, uh, chat has been around um, perhaps some of the mindsets in, in business and other organizations that we've seen. So curious if there's other, I guess, areas or arenas of, of innovation that, that you, know, you speakers would, I, would identify or add to that list, but also want to kind of touch on, I flagged it earlier, this question around technology. Um, so often technology is seen as this kind of silver bullet. We just need that next gizmo or gadget, as you, as you called it, Anne. Um, is, it, is it potentially going to be the silver bullet in, in the health space? Is it a distraction um, to some of the, this harder, uh, more conceptual work that we need to do? What, what do we think? I can um, I can start off. I think I think it needs to, um, and perhaps COVID is the right right uh, forum here uh, to be able to push. I think some of our uh, lax areas in terms of technology. So technology increasingly becoming important to health systems. Telemedicine's been a really big contributor to the to the COVID outbreak. Um, yet prior to the COVID outbreak, I mean, it was kind of, you know, filling gaps in some countries, but now I think potentially has an opportunity to be seen much more systemically. So there are some real opportunities. Um, likewise, the importance of, of, of what I just talked about with the genomics and so on and the data science combining to be able to produce something powerful and long-term, um, potentially underpinning, um, I was just listening to Anne, you know, long-term, studies for, for diabetics who've been through the COVID experience, for example, given that they've been disproportionately uh, represented in the mortality statistics, and don't start me on the mortality statistics, but, but let's talk about the mortality data. You know, there's a traditional data set which is not done well around the world, and a lot of countries have really found that they've struggled to produce real-time data about basic things like deaths. So I think my point would be that there's lots of opportunities in technology, but we need to also use technology to be able to push some of the things we need in an immediate sense as well, and that the attention also needs to be paid there. And with that, I'll hand over. Interesting. So check in the right ways, potentially, and then the great strategic. Uh, can't see everyone here. We're curious of it. Anne, Katie, Christina, anyone want to come in on well, that? Well, I just unmuted myself. I was looking for the hand, but I couldn't find it. So I don't know what is that <laughs> hand. Yeah. No, I, I and I think I... I I don't think necessarily it's, it, it's the it's the full silver bullet. There will have to be behavioral science as well because there's so many things we can. It's the data, the technology. How do we create the insights that we need? But we also need to understand that an app can kind of change the whole picture. We also need to understand the social uh, behavioral science. We need to understand the social interaction. There's so many things that need to be thought into the same solution if we want them to be effective. Because I think we've seen examples out of South Africa where insurance companies are building rewards if you get um, 
if you if you look into your in, into your diet if you uh, start moving around you you can kind of earn points and then you can and get, get an award so so the so so the components of that which is really good components of that that could be a little bit challenging but it's that sort of thing that we need to combine to create not just the insight but also the changes that we need to see happen with the individual because this is also a kind of saying okay there are things that have to happen on the individual level and then there's things that have to change on a system level as well mm -hmm. just to build okay. just to build on Anne's point I I couldn't agree more and I think the, the point for me is around the fact that tech is only as good as the people who use it and build it and so tech on its own is as Anne said you know not the silver bullet but if we think about just the ability for somebody who's in a remote place to be able to get through their mobile phone access to um, quality information about their health is something that just didn't happen you know it relied on word of mouth or somebody else having experienced it before etc before and um, but again that's about quality and there's so much information almost out there now that it's about sifting through and take and finding the 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 information that is most useful and trusted and that's really difficult and we can see that on so many different scales around you know fake news and our great leaders around the world absolutely yeah Christina, any, any comments from you on this, this one? I can just add an example for, um, because I think everyone has um, uh, said what, uh, what, I, what, what I also uh, see is the tech is the enabler, but you need to look at the system level and how things are changing. And I think a, a good example we've worked on is um, like uh, there's so much excitement about drones and you know drones uh, reaching remote places. We've worked with a um, health logistics company to introduce drones to help them fly um, blood to remote um, hospitals in order to save, uh, especially uh, women that uh, suffer from postpartum hemorrhage. But the innovation there is not the drone. I mean, drones can fly blood. Uh, the, the really hard thing is how to integrate it into the system, how to make sure that um, yeah, hospitals reach out uh, to that uh, logistics provider and to uh, uh, allow all of this uh, happening. So regulatory change, uh, working with the government to make sure that um, drones can fly. So I'd say, yeah, tech is, is amazing what it, what it, can, what it brings, uh, artificial intelligence and uh, everything the colleagues have mentioned. But the real work starts when you start to embed uh, these innovations in the system. And there's uh, often not enough focus, I would say, on, um, on, on supporting uh, these changes because there's an implicit assumption that if the technology works, then it'll all fall into place. But that's not the case. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Very, very important. And conscious, our, our time has flown by absolutely um, quickly. But in, in the remaining minutes, I wonder if I could maybe pose, pose two questions and, and each of you could come in on, on one or both of them. One is to come back to actually Katie's original question around, you know, are there ways for us to really be learning from this rapid innovation, things that we can take with us beyond just applications to COVID-19? So if you have further thoughts on that, um, I think we'd love to hear them. And also the second, which is giving each of you a bit of a, a wish, if you like, for, for the future. One wish, one, you know, you've got to wave your magic wand on one thing to help us get to 2030 with the health that, that, we, that we want around the world. What would it be? And it maybe another way to phrase that. I liked, Anne, when you mentioned about COVID-19 kind of being a magnifying glass on something. Where else would you maybe want to wave your wand or your magnifying glass to really shine a light or, or a lens on? <laughs> Just a couple of small questions to end. <laughs> Who wants to be I would, like to, <laughs> I would definitely love to wave it on how we measure value or growth. Uh, I do think we need to uh, revamp the whole economic system and how we understand we thrive as a world. So that's where I would, if, if, if the magnifying glass become a magic wand, that's where I would wave it. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Excellent. That's a big, big task, big one. Excellent. Others, Katie, Annika. Um, well, I, I, how, how do you follow like complete sort of <laughs> <world shift? laughs> new system that, of value? And that one. <laughs> That'd be great. Um, I think on a sort of more micro level, one is about, and I, I noted there's a question about it and we were just talking about that last mile distribution. It's, it's always going to be really challenging. Um, and I think the other one, uh, perhaps a little bit more for sort of developed markets is around the, the importance of um, preventative and community support, um, whether it's through mental health or whether it's through health, and etc. Um, ultimately, 
once you get into hospital etc th th that's the, too late um so that for me is wave the magic wand is more joined up more investment into the preventative and the community activity mm -hmm. i'd like to build on that one i think that i'd like to see um more built into um, universal health approaches that are technology enabled and i think telemedicine is one of the examples that we've got at the moment that that health systems around the world can can benefit from uh, not only the universal health approach but the, the technologies that are really being tested and proven now as being uh, of significant potential in helping some health systems to plug their gap. Um, I guess if I wanted to make an, uh, a suggestion or a, a, a plea for things that we can preserve from this particular outbreak um, to help take us forward, it's going to be around multidisciplinary partnerships. And we talked about, you guys all talked about this, you know, that technology is just the enabler. In a health system, you need, you know, medical doctors, um, all your health professionals, plus then you might need statisticians and you might need epidemiologists and so on. There's so many people that need to come together. And again, um, going back to, to that point, maybe tech is the way that these various elements can come together in a different way for health systems generally. They would be my two points. Excellent. So much there. And Christina, is there anything really, left uh, for you to wish for? Yeah, yeah I, I really wish that we can keep uh, keep this agile approach to, to collaboration. I find it very inspiring to see what has been happening and, and I wish we can um, really figure that out because I think um, inside companies it's already happening, um, but not across uh, organizations. So uh, if, I, if I had a fairy, I think that I would ask the fairy to kind of tip the, the heads of some of the people in key organizations to look more externally and, and see opportunities to collaborate outside their organizations. So it's really also about mindset shift and seeing that no individual organization can fix any of these big problems, that you have to look outside and you have to see how you tie up uh, with others. So that would be... Uh, my big wish is uh, that uh, we become a lot more collaborative. Fantastic. Well, I appreciate all of you engaging with the with the challenging question, and, and obviously, I think you know, can't help but agree that if we could get all of those um, areas covered and, and, and things in place, we'd be doing more on prevention, um, you know, more last mile distribution, tech enabled, um, you know, universal healthcare, a, a more agile mindset in, in collaborative, multidisciplinary um arenas and uh, that kind of mega new way of of seeing value and, and potentially measuring growth wouldn't it be quite a different world in 2030 if all that came to be so i love to end on that on that more inspirational note and hope that that does um inspire and, and give some insights to some who may be on the line or who are connected to some of the the great innovators and pioneers that might um be intrigued and, and, and be working in this area to potentially benefit from from the prize that we're, it's been somewhat of the reason that we're here today. So I just wanna quickly flash up um, that again, that information in case it's relevant to you or partners and stakeholders that you work with to get um, them involved. And also to say that we're still hoping to do um, a final session in this series more focused on energy or potentially around the nexus of some of these issues um, early next week. We'll see if we'll have enough time to squeeze that in um, in support of this. So keep uh, an eye on sustainably.com and our events page or, or LinkedIn or Twitter for more on that. Uh, we'll be sharing the recording of these conversations. So if you missed it or you want someone else in your, your sphere to to be exposed to some of the thinking, uh, we'll definitely share that. Really delighted to see such an active chat function and, and conversations and exchange of details. Feels like we've just scraped the surface of such a, a big important topic. So perhaps there'll be a follow-up um, in due course uh, with, with all, all of these great uh, minds and, and doers here. But other than that, I want to have you join me virtually in thanking our excellent speakers for their time and insights today. So Anne, Annika, Katie, and Christina, it's been a real pleasure to be speaking with you today. Thanks, Denise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And to everyone, take care where you are, stay healthy, um, and uh, hopefully we'll be speaking again soon. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye.